Uh, thanks, Bob, um, and and thanks uh, everybody for coming. I'm sure you're all really busy, and I appreciate you taking the time out to come. Of course, if you're a student, if you're a student at UNC, you have to come to these things. Um, I don't know if you guys have to come, or if this is voluntary, but we always have great turnouts because the students, they're forced to come. Um, right. Uh, so yeah. So thanks for having me. It's been a really nice visit. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, causal inference in the presence of interference. Um, and just before I forget, I want to acknowledge my collaborators. Um, Betts Halloran is a colleague. She's at the University of Washington in the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle. And she's the one who introduced me to this problem. Uh, Lon Liu was a graduate student who just finished up with me. And I'll be showing you some results from her dissertation. Uh, Lon's now at uh, Harvard working with uh, Eric Chechen. And uh, Carl was a postdoc in our department. Um, and I'll be showing you some of the work that, that she did while she was with us as well. And of course, I'm always grateful for funding from, from the NIH to support this work. Um, so the, the, the first thing I want to do is just talk about sort of classic causal inference. Causal inference 101, just in case you haven't been exposed to, to causal inference before. At, at least at UNC, it's not something that's part of the standard curriculum for our students. So a lot of people aren't familiar with the idea. Um, and then I'll talk about some extensions of this, these sort of classical results to allow for um, so-called interference between units. OK, so first, this is sort of the, the classic simple problem. Um, so I'm going to let Z denote uh, treatment um, indicator. So it's one if you receive a treatment or an exposure. Um, I, my collaborative work is in infectious diseases, so I'm often thinking of the treatment as a vaccine. Yeah. Uh, so Z will be one if you're vaccinated, um, or you get a treatment or exposure, and it will be zero otherwise. And then uh, for each individual, we envision two possible potential outcomes for that individual. Uh, one outcome if they receive treatment, and another outcome if they do not receive treatment. Okay, so maybe the outcome is whether or not you get disease um, from some uh, infectious pathogen. And we imagine if you got treated, you do or do not get disease. That's one potential outcome. And if you don't get treated, you do or do not get disease. That's the other potential outcome. So everybody's walking around with sort of these two potential outcomes. And we say that the exposure or treatment has an effect if those two potential outcomes are different. Uh, and if they're the same, then the treatment has no effect. Um, so we might call that the individual causal effect. So if your two potential outcomes are the same, the exposure has no effect for you, has no causal effect. If your two potential outcomes are different, then it has an effect. Okay. Um, and we might write that as a contrast, like a difference in your potential outcomes. In the vaccine world, people like 1 minus risk ratios, so we might write the contrast this way. Uh, and the fundamental problem of causal inference is that usually we only get to see at most one of these two potential outcomes. So as soon as you're exposed, I get to see why one, but I don't get to see why not. Or if you're unexposed, I get to see why not or not why one. And so therefore, we can identify from the data these individual causal effects. So instead, what we can think about are summary or population level causal effects. And these are things that we can identify and draw inference about from the data. So um, for example, we might define the average causal effect to just be the average of the individual causal effects. Yeah. Um, or maybe we take the median of the individual causal effects. Uh, Rubin calls these typical unit level causal effects. Um, or alternatively, we might uh, define our causal estimates in, in terms of marginal causal effects. And so a couple of those are given here. So we might ask, well, what's the median outcome if everybody was unexposed? compared to what is the medium outcome if, if everybody was exposed. Um, so these are marginal causal effects in the sense that I'm getting some measure of central tendency of the, the marginal distribution of the y-naughts and comparing that to the marginal distribution of the y-1s. Of course, the average causal effect, you can think of that either way as a typical unit level causal effect or a marginal causal effect. Um, but that's not true, say, if you use medians instead. You would have two different causal estimates. Um, so this distinction may not seem very important in the trivial case, but in the setting of interference, uh, it seems to us that we can make progress. Uh, the problem's a little more tractable if you think about marginal causal effects instead of typical unit level causal effects. So this will be more of the approach that we use um, in the work I'm going to show you. Um, okay, so 
Uh, the, the first half of this talk is going to use this so-called randomization-based inference. Um, I know Ben's worked on this. Some of you may be familiar with it as well. And it dates back to Naaman. Um, the idea here is we're going to think of a finite population of n units. So there's no superpopulation that I'm drawing a random sample from. I'm just interested in the n units that I've got, the n people that showed up for my clinical trial, maybe a convenient sample, whatever. I just want to draw inference about these folks and their potential outcomes. And then um, we're going to do a randomized experiment and randomize individuals so they either receive treatment or not. So the thing that's random here is, is treatment assignment. So I'm using a big Z just to make sure you recognize that's random. Whereas the potential outcomes of just thinking of those as fixed features of the finite population, they're constants, so they're little y's. Once we assign people treatment, that reveals their observed outcome. So um, different ways that you can express that. So this is just one of the two potential outcomes. The other one goes missing. And then Naaman suggested as an estimator for the average causal effect, this guy, ASAP, which is exactly what you would think to do, just take the average of the observed responses amongst individuals that are assigned control, subtract from that the average of the observed responses of individuals assigned treatment. And what Neyman showed was that this was, um, in a completely randomized experiment, this was an unbiased estimator of the average causal effect. And so by that, when we say unbiased, we mean the expectation equals ACE. And here we're taking the expectation with respect to Z. So we're thinking about all the hypothetical ways we could have randomized these N units uh, to receive treatment or not. And if you compute ACE hat for all possible ways of randomizing individuals, um, and you take the average of those ACE hats, you get the true average causal effect. The other thing Naaman considered was a variance estimator of ACE hat. And he suggested this, which is the usual um, estimator the variance when your statistic is a difference in sample means, right? You just take the uh, sample variance for the contr control group, divide by the sample size, and add to that the sample variance of the observations for the treated group, and divide by sample size. And this estimator, um, again, in a randomization inference-based sense, um, is positively biased in the sense that if you take its expected value, you get the actual variance of ACE hat plus this extra bias term. Uh, and this bias term, sigma squared zero one, is the variance of the individual causal effects. Okay? So if you have a situation where the causal effect is additive in the sense that the effect is the same for all n units, then this variance term will be zero and you have an unbiased estimator. Otherwise, your variance estimator is too large. But as statisticians, we can live with that, right? We're okay if our inference is conservative. We just don't want to be anti-conservative. So Neyman's um, estimators is too big um, unless you have additivity. And then um, you can appeal to finite sample central limit theorems using Hayek type conditions uh, to sort of justify uh, walled type confidence intervals using uh, Neyman's estimators. Okay. Now what's nice about this randomization inference paradigm is we're making very few assumptions. Essentially, we've only made two assumptions so far. One was that treatment was randomly assigned. And the, the second assumption is uh, this so-called SUFA assumption, stable unit treatment value assumption. Now, this talk is about relaxing SUFA, so I'll explain what that means in a minute. Um, but note what we didn't assume. We didn't assume any assumption underlying the distribution of the outcomes. Um, and we didn't make any assumptions about random sampling from some superpopulation. So in that sense, this, this approach is very appealing. All right, so what is SUPA? Um, so that, this notation, uh, why not, why one is sufficient, relies on this, this assumption of SUPA, um, that each individual only has two potential outcomes, assumes two things. First, it assumes that there are no different versions of treatment. Sometimes this is called causal consistency but there, there aren't different versions of treatment around. Or if there are different versions of treatment around, no matter which one I give you, you have the same potential outcome. So why one is sufficient to describe all of the potential outcomes you would have if assigned treatment. And same with why not, there's only one version of control. The other assumption is no interference between units, and that's what this talk is about, is relaxing that assumption. So no interference says that the outcome of one individual is not affected by the treatment assignment of another individual. Um, and clearly, this is not going to be true in some settings. So the motivating example for us is in infectious diseases, 
whether or not one person gets, say, vaccinated could affect whether or not another person gets an infectious disease. Whether or not my daughter gets flu shot this fall could affect whether or not I get flu this winter. She gets the flu shot, maybe she doesn't get flu, and she doesn't bring it to the house, and I don't get it. She fails to get the flu shot, she might get flu, come in the house and infect me, right? So that's interference. Her treatment assignment, whether or not she's vaccinated, is affecting my health. Um, educational interventions, I've been talking to Ben about this during the visit. So you can imagine interference between students that are in the same class. You give tutoring or something to a student, uh, it might affect the test scores of the student that sits next to them in class. So you might have interference between students in the same classroom. Sobel had a paper in JASA in 2006 looking at uh, housing mobility studies and the effect of giving a voucher uh, to uh, a household to move out of a low-income neighborhood. And he was worried about interference between households in the same neighborhood there. Does giving the voucher to one household affect the chance that a neighboring household might move? Maybe in the neighboring household those are cousins or extended family members. Um, sort of traditional statistics comes out of agriculture. And you can imagine agricultural experiments where you give a pesticide or a fertilizer to one plant and it could affect the growth of a neighboring plant. Um, in sort of a different light, you can think of crossover studies as having interference within an individual. So the treatment for an individual at one time point might affect their outcome at another time point. Um, and there are myriad other areas where you can think about interference. But sometimes this is a phenomenon of interest. Sometimes it's a nuisance. So in, say, in crossover studies, this kind of interference we don't really want. So Usually we try to space out the two visits uh, so there's a long enough so-called washout period. So there is an interference, right? So you try to eliminate that. But in some settings, this is actually something we want to study. It's not that we want to get rid of interference. So for example, infectious diseases is an inherent part of the science, right? This is a disease that's transmitted from one person to another. So it's not that we want to somehow structure a study where we eliminate that. Rather, it's something we want to study and, and try to quantify and say something about. Here's a motivating example. Um, this is a reanalysis of a cholera vaccine trial that took place in Matla, Bangladesh in the 1980s. And um, what these investigators did in this paper in, in 2005 was they, um, they were able to geocode where everybody lived during this vaccine trial. And so they went back and got the data and then they stratified everybody um, according to the level of vaccine coverage in the Bari where they lived. Okay, so by level of vaccine coverage, I just mean the proportion of people around them that were vaccinated. And a Bari is a, a collection of patrilineal related households. So it's just a cluster of households where people are related to each other. And so they stratified everybody according to the level of coverage, vaccine coverage in their Bari. And these were the results that they got. So for example, in the first row here, these are this is amongst people who, have, who live in Baris where there's at least 50% vaccine coverage. And they found that the incidence of cholera was about 1.3 cases of cholera per thousand person years amongst individuals who'd been vaccinated compared to 1.47 uh, cases of cholera per thousand person years amongst people who weren't vaccinated. Okay, so a modest protective effect of the vaccine, a slight reduction in incidence. Um, in contrast, if you look at, at individuals who lived in bars with the lowest vaccine coverage, um, the incidence was 2.7 in the vaccinees versus 7 in the placebo recipients. So a much stronger direct effect or protective effect of the vaccine in low coverage situations. Also, if you look in the far right column, you can see that the incidence goes up as the coverage goes down in placebo recipients. So these are all people who aren't receiving vaccine. This is suggestive that there's interference, right? This is the treatment assignment or the vaccination assignment of other people having an effect on their outcome. So Betts Halloran and her, her, her colleague um, Struckner in the 90s wrote a couple papers sort of thinking about these ideas. They were sort of thought pieces. There wasn't a lot of statistics in them. Uh, and they suggested we could think about four different types of causal effects that we might want to be interested in when there's interference. Um, and so this schematic uh, depicts those four effects, and we'll make these more precise in a few moments. Um, but imagine this, uh, this circle is um, a group of individu 
individuals that potentially interfere with each other. So this might be uh, like a Bari in, in Bangladesh. Okay? And maybe half of them get vaccinated and half do not. And then you can imagine that maybe this is the same Bari, but now no one's getting vaccinated. So we might define the direct effect to be a contrast in what happens on average uh, when somebody's vaccinated compared to when they're not vaccinated, when the level of vaccine coverage is held fixed at 50%. Okay? So the only thing that's changing there, sorry, is the individual treatment assignment. So that's the direct effect of receiving treatment. The indirect effect, in some sense, is the opposite of that. So you say, what's the average outcome when someone's unvaccinated? when they're in a situation where there's 50% coverage compared to when there's no coverage. So there you're holding the individual treatment assignment fixed and you're varying the level of coverage around them. Okay, so it's an indirect effect because you're not, you're not varying their, cover, their treatment assignment at all. You're varying what's happening to everybody else and what sort of indirect effect does it have on them. And then the total effect would be the sum of those two. So what happens on average when I'm vaccinated in a high coverage situation compared to if I'm not vaccinated uh, in a low coverage situation. And from a, from a public policy standpoint, maybe the most important thing is the overall effect. So what happens on average if we attain 50% vaccine coverage versus if, if we didn't vaccinate at all? This is incidence. So these are, these are cases of cholera per thousand person years. So they followed everybody for one year. Okay, so when we started to think about this problem, um, we, we tried to keep things as simple as possible and sort of think about the ideal situation. Um, and so we thought the simplest approach would be to assume that you could put partition individuals into groups where within groups there might be interference, but there's no interference across groups. So if two individuals are in different groups, they're not interfering with each other. We call that partial interference. And for almost the rest of the talk almost entirely will assume that there's partial interference. So you can partition people up into groups. So these are like baris that are sufficiently separated geographically. We're not worried about interference between individuals in different baris. Or maybe these are schools that are sufficiently separated geographically. Um, so we'll make that assumption throughout and then we'll define formally these different causal effects. Um, and then in order to draw inference um, we're going to imagine, again, sort of the ideal situation that I can do a randomized experiment. In this case, we're going to do a two-stage randomized experiment. In the first stage, we're going to randomize groups to different levels of coverage, different allocation strategies. And then at the second stage, um, we'll randomize individuals to receive treatment or not, conditional on what their group was assigned in the first stage. And then we can use randomization-based inference from the observable data to draw inference about the causal effects that we define. So, for example, we might want to study the direct, indirect, so on effects of vaccination in school-aged children. So here the groups might be schools that are sufficiently separated geographically. The individuals might be students in those schools. Then at the first stage of randomization, we might randomize some of the schools to have 50% vaccine coverage, other schools to get 25% vaccine coverage. And then the second stage of randomization, we randomize students within those schools and depending on what happened in the first stage, we either flip a coin that will come up heads with probability 0.5 or uh, with probability 0.25, depending on which allocation strategy their school was assigned. Um, here's just kind of a picture. This is four groups of four. Um, this is not a, not a DAG. Uh, this is, um, these arrows and nodes are, so the nodes are supposed to denote individuals and the arrows indicating that they're potentially interfering with each other. So we've got four groups of four, maybe two of them get assigned 50% uh, vaccine coverage, the other two to 25% vaccine coverage, and then two of the four uh, are randomly assigned vaccine in these two groups, and one of the four is randomly assigned uh, vaccine in those two groups. So that's the idea. Um, so here's some notation to make all this a, a bit more precise. Big N groups, N sub I individuals per group. Um, ZI will be a vector of treatment assignments for the NI individuals in group I. The components of that vector, just ZIJ, are just indicators of whether or not individual J in group I is assigned treatment. So the ZIJs take on 0 or 1. You've got a vector of length NI, so that vector ZI will take on two of the NI possible values. 
Sometimes it's helpful to denote uh, the, the zi vector with the jth entry deleted. So that's just the vector of length ni minus 1 with that jth person pulled out of it. Little z's denote realizations of big z's. And then the z's will live in rm, uh, which is just the set of all possible treatment assignment vectors of length m. So r squared would be 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. And um, rn sub k is just the subset of rn where exactly k individuals uh, are receiving treatment. So if, if you've got a vector in R and K, it's of length N, it's got all zeros and ones in it, and it's, it's got exactly K ones. Um, and then corresponding to uh, the first stage of randomization, remember we're randomizing groups first to different allocation strategies. Um, we need some variable to indicate what we've assigned the groups to. So we're going to use S for that. So S will be one if a group gets assigned um, an allocation strategy, which I'm just calling alpha 1, and 0 if it's assigned some other allocation strategy, which will denote alpha naught. Um, S will be the vector of uh, group level indicator variables. C will be the total number of groups assigned allocation strategy alpha 1. So this would be like the total number of schools signed 50% vaccine coverage. Um, nu is the parameterization that governs S. And again, just to keep things really simple, I'm going to assume that at each stage of randomization, we have a completely randomized experiment. And that just means that I'm going to assume this C is fixed by design. And that each N choose C ways of uh, assigning C groups to allocation strategy alpha 1, each occur with equal probability. Uh, I'll let KI denote the total number of individuals that are assigned treatment in group I. And again, conditional on what happens after the first stage of randomization, the second stage of randomization, assume we have a completely randomized experiment. So this KI is fixed and each NI choose KI ways of assigning KI individuals to treatment occur with equal probability. Okay, now the potential outcomes. Remember before it was sufficient just to write down a pair, but because we're allowing for partial interference, we're allowing for interference between individuals within a group, now an individual's potential outcome can depend not only on their own treatment assignment, but the vector of treatment assignments for everybody else in their group. So we write the potential outcomes more generally uh, this way, it's now a function of that whole entire vector. Um, it does not, and, and you'll note, it does not depend on the vector for uh, of treatment assignments for other groups not equal to i because of the partial interference assumption. Uh, sometimes it's helpful to write this out in longhand where we, we spell out exactly what's happening to individual j compared to what's happening to everybody else in the group. And because this is a function of this vector zi, it means that now individuals are all going to have two to the ni potential outcomes instead of in the classic causal inference where everybody just has two potential outcomes. That seems kind of messy and maybe intractable. So one way to move forward, since everybody has so many potential outcomes now, uh, would be to think about the average potential outcomes for an individual. So y bar uh, ij will denote the average outcome for individual j in group i when uh, they're assigned treatment Z and their group is assigned allocation strategy alpha 1. And all this is is just their average or expected outcome um, conditional on that individual having assigned treatment Z and their group um, having been assigned allocation strategy alpha 1. So, um, so that's um, one way to sort of move forward and deal with the fact that somebody has, everybody has so many potential outcomes now. And then we could average these individual potential outcomes across all the individuals in a group and get a group average potential outcome and average across groups to get a population average potential outcome. So this would be interpreted as the average outcome in the population when an individual is assigned treatment Z and their group is assigned allocation strategy alpha 1. So for example, this might be uh, if Y is an indicator of um, infection, this would be what what's the average um, risk, say, of, some, of a student being infected if they've been vaccinated and they're in a the school with 50% vaccine coverage. You can do the same thing marginally where you ignore what happens at the individual level. So I could just compute the average potential outcome for individual J when their group is assigned allocation strategy alpha 1, regardless of whether or not they're receiving treatment or not. And then you can average those marginal individual average potential outcomes across individuals in a group and then average the group averages across the groups to get a population uh, marginal average potential outcome. And these, um, these population average potential outcomes, 
are going to be the building blocks for the causal estimates that we're going to uh, try to draw inference about. So here are those four um, uh, estimates that I showed you on the graph earlier. Um, the direct causal effect um, is defined here. So this is just the average potential outcome when an individual is not treated compared to when an individual is treated, holding the allocation strategy fixed for their group at alpha 1. Uh, the indirect effect, or what some people are calling the spillover effect, um, is the opposite of that. So that's what's the average outcome uh, when an individual uh, does not receive treatment and their group is assigned allocation strategy alpha naught compared to if their group had been assigned allocation strategy alpha 1. You could define an indirect effect similarly for treated individuals, but just for simplicity, we'll only define this spillover or indirect effect in untreated individuals. The total effect is the sum of the indirect and the direct, um, and the which is another way of writing that is is the average outcome if you don't receive treatment and the group got alpha naught versus you do receive treatment and your group got alpha one, and then the overall causal effect is just a difference in those marginal population average potential outcomes. So uh, the direct plus the indirect is the total. So you have this nice decomposition of the total effect into these two parts. Um, this is different than classic causal inference because now you've got your, your causal estimates defined uh, depending on the allocation strategy, which would not be the case if there was no interference. This is uh, in the notation we're using. This is what the no interference assumption looks like. So it just says for individual J, uh, their potential outcomes for uh, treatment assignment vector zi and zi prime are going to be the same whenever the jth component of those two vectors is the same. So that's just uh, another way of stating the no interference assumption. And under no interference, the indirect effect equals zero, and therefore the total effect is going to equal the, the direct effect. Okay, so that's our tar target of inference. Those are the estimates that we're after. Um, and, and now we'll give some unbiased estimators of those uh, estimates. Again, assuming that we've got this the ideal situation where we have a two-stage randomized study. And at each stage, we have a completely randomized experiment. So the, estimate, the estimators are exactly what you would think to do. Uh, first, we just take an average of responses uh, amongst individuals who are assigned treatment Z, which you could write this way. Or if you like, you could write this, uh, express it more as an inverse probability weighted estimator. Um, and then take an average of those group level estimators across all the groups that are assigned allocation strategy alpha 1. And that's our estimator of the average potential outcome when individuals assign treatment Z and groups are assigned allocation strategy alpha 1. Um, and you can show that that's an unbiased estimator. Again, this is using randomization based inference in the same spirit as Naaman. So this is thinking about all possible ways you could re randomize groups and then individuals within groups. And if you could conduct this experiment over and over again, on average, this estimator gives you the right answer. And that immediately leads to unbiased estimators of uh, the different causal effects. And you can do the same thing marginally. Just take the average of all the responses in a group, ignoring whether or not individuals are assigned treatment or not. Then average those group level marginal estimators across groups assigned um, allocation strategy alpha 1, and you get an unbiased estimator of the uh, marginal population average potential outcome, and that leads to an unbiased estimator of the overall effect. Okay, so that sort of gives us the first extension of Naaman, right? Um, Naaman proposed ACE hat, this unbiased estimator of ACE, and so now we've got something analogous to that in the setting where we have interference, where we have partial interference. So the next thing is, is about variance estimators. Um, and you can show that um, you can't identify uh, the variance of these estimators, basically. Um, uh, in other words, an, you can show that an unbiased estimator of the variance of these estimators doesn't exist without making some further assumptions. So one possible assumption that might be entertained is what we're calling stratified interference. And that says that uh, the potential outcome for individual J in group I uh, depends on their treatment assignment and the sum of the treatment assignment for everybody else in their group. Okay. Um, so if you go back to the school age 
children example in vaccines, what this says is that for individual J, uh, for student J in the class, their potential outcome depends on whether or not they're vaccinated and um, how many of the classmates were vaccinated, but not on which particular classmates it is, just on how many other classmates. So this is sort of an intermediate assumption but between making no assumption about the structure of interference and, be, and assuming no interference at all. Uh, so if you hold uh, an individual's treatment assignment fixed, um, if you assume no interference, then they only have one potential outcome. If you make no assumptions, um, then they have two to the ni minus one potential outcomes. And if you take this sort of intermediate road of assuming stratified interference, then they have ni potential outcomes. So maybe this is a, a reasonable model um, for some situations. And it's, it's sufficient. Um, I'll skip that slide and I'll just get to the punchline. It's sufficient to allow us to get variance estimators for these different causal effects. So under um, stratified interference, um, you can get um, unbiased estimators of the variance of um, the, the different uh, average potential outcome estimators. And you can get um, variance estimators of the causal effect estimators that are unbiased when the corresponding effect is additive and positively biased otherwise. So I'm not, I'm not showing you all the math here, but uh, that's the punchline. So if you go back, um, we, here are our estimators, and you want, now you want to estimate, say, the variance of D e hat. Okay. Um, so what, if, if you're willing to assume stratified interference, then uh, you can get a variance estimator of the variance of D e hat, an estimator of the variance of D e hat, that um, is going to be positively biased if the direct effect um, is not additive and unbiased if the direct effect is additive. So in other words, we're getting again e exactly extensions of Neyman's results to the setting where there's interference. So we're able to get these variance estimators positively biased unless the corresponding uh, effect is additive, in which case they're unbiased. So more recently, um, I had this student, Lan Lu, come and wanted to work with me on interference. And so I asked her, under what conditions would it be reasonable to take those estimators and the variance estimators can construct walled confidence intervals? When would that be justified? And so she worked out um, theoretical justification for doing that. She studied uh, basically the large sample properties of these estimators under two different conditions. One where the groups are getting large. Uh, so the n sub i's are tending towards infinity. And then another one where the number of groups are getting large. So she studied the large sample properties under, under either of those conditions. And basically what she showed under certain Hayek and Lineberg type conditions uh, that these, um, these estimators are consistent and asymptotically normal. And in order for this to be justified when the groups are getting large, uh, you need some additional homogeneity assumptions uh, about the effect, uh, the different effects across groups. She also, just for comparison's sake, she looked at Chebyshev type um, confidence intervals and she compared those with exact confidence intervals that Chechen and Vanderweel proposed in uh, this 2012 paper based on Hofting inequalities. Um, and so I'll show you some of the results from her work. So first, um, this is the situation where you have um, ni large and n small. So you're letting the, the group sizes get large, but there's only a finite number of them. And what she showed in that situation is that the limiting distribution of these estimators is a mixture of Gaussians. Um, the red line here in these plots denotes the theoretical distribution. And then the uh, histograms are the empirical distribution from simulated data, showing good agreement with the the predicted theoretical distribution. Um, so without um, some sort of homogeneity or additional assumptions, um, the walled type confidence intervals aren't justified in this setting. Here are some simulation results comparing the um, walled uh, Chebyshev and exact confidence intervals for the direct, indirect, total, and overall effect. Um, looking at different number, numbers of groups, so a small number of groups up to a relatively large number of groups. And then these table entries give you the average width of the confidence interval and the empirical coverage. Okay. So in this upper left-hand corner, for example, we see both the walled confidence interval and the Chebyshev confidence intervals are undercovering. 
They're not giving the nominal 0.95. The exact confidence interval is covering, but it's quite Y. These are simulations where Y is binary. So you actually, you know that the truth uh, lives between minus 1 and 1. So the widest, if a confidence interval has width 2 or greater, it's completely non-informative. You can see the exact confidence intervals are quite wide. Um, this is a situation where the groups are heterogeneous, so we did not expect the wall confidence intervals to perform well because the large sample distribution is this mixture of Gaussians. Uh, but when n is large, uh, the wall confidence intervals uh, should perform well, and they do, and you can see that they're substantially narrower than the exact confidence intervals. Um, in situations where uh, the groups are homogeneous, things are a little bit better. The wall confidence interval is still undercover a bit, and this has to do with the variance estimator. So if we actually use the true variance, then the wall cover, confidence intervals cover as promised. But I think the variance estimator itself may not be consistent when ni is getting large, but n is staying small. Uh, but once you get up to, say, somewhere between 10 and 30, uh, the walled confidence intervals do quite well, and they're sometimes two orders of magnitude more narrow than the exact confidence intervals. So here's a, a hypothetical example of this two-stage randomized experiment. Um, we did this sort of for two reasons. One was because we were trying to think of the ideal situation, but also because we didn't have access to the actual cholera data at the time. Um, so I'm not necessarily saying this is the experiment you'd want to do, but imagine you took Motlob, Bangladesh, and you broke it up into five districts. And you randomize two of those districts to get high vaccine coverage, say 50%, and the other three to get low vaccine coverage. Then you followed individuals for a year and you counted up the number of cholera cases. You might get a table that looks like this. And from this, you could, um, you could compute estimates of the direct effect under the two different allocation strategies, the indirect effect total and overall. And these are the corresponding confidence intervals. Um, these point estimates are in uh, per thousand individuals per year. That's why part part of the reason why these numbers are so wide. Um, so these uh, I think these estimates have a very nice interpretation. They're straightforward to explain to non-statisticians. So for example, the direct effect estimate of 3.6 that says we'd expect 3.6 fewer cases uh, per thousand person years among vaccinated individuals compared to unvaccinated individuals when the coverage is 30 percent. Uh, the total effect also has a nice um, straightforward interpretation as well. All of these estimators do. Um, and then based on the simulations, we think the walled confidence intervals here are probably too narrow and would not be credible. And the exact confidence intervals are uh, completely non-informative in this case. Uh, so the Chebyshev might be, might be preferred. Um, and now I'd like to move away from this ideal setting where we have a randomized experiment to where we have observational data. Um, and it's still, it could be that we still have randomization, but maybe not at both levels. So you can imagine a situation where you have uh, maybe a group randomized try to study, like a classic cluster randomized trial. Um, but not everybody in groups assigned treatment uh, comply, right? So you wouldn't have 100% coverage in the, the groups that were assigned treatment. Or you might have a study like the study in MOTLAB where individuals were randomized to vaccine or placebo, but not everybody chose to participate in the study. So if you include everybody in MOTLAB, not just the trial participants, then you have an observational study that has this randomized study at the individual level sort of built in. So what, what can we do when we have either an observational data or partially randomized data? Um, can we still draw inference about these types of causal effects? And I'm going to um, focus mostly on this IPW estimator that uh, Eric and Tyler proposed in that same 2012 paper. And so they suggested um, this IPW estimator as a means to estimate the, the causal effects we defined earlier. Um, and the uh, idea here is you take the observed responses for an individual in so individual J in group I, and you inverse weight it by this estimated group level propensity score. So this um, here, Xi is denoting uh, baseline covariates for group I. 
and um, somehow you model um, the probability treatment assignment vector for that group. So you might use, for example, a mixed effects logistic regression model. Okay. And I'm assuming we we can do that well, and uh, this is um, an estimate of that model. Okay. Um, and so what Tyler and Eric showed was if you actually, if you knew the propensity score, not if you had to estimate it, but if you knew the group level propensity score, that this is an unbiased estimator of the average potential outcome in group I when an individual is assigned Z and the group is assigned allocation strategy alpha. So we, um, our goal was to apply this estimator uh, to the actual MOTLAB data. So we got a hold of this data and because of this observational nature, we have data on everybody in MOTLAB, not just the trial participants. And so we want to use that data um, and this estimator to draw inference about the effect of, of the cholera vaccine. Uh, you can use um, standard M estimation theory to show that this IPW estimator is consistent and astatically normal. And we've been working with uh, an empirical sandwich variance estimator that seems to be performing pretty well. We did some simulations before we analyzed our data just to make sure that uh, this estimator was behaving the way we expected. And we, we did simulations where there was confounding, so there was a baseline covariate, and there were actually two baseline covariates that were affecting individuals' decision to participate or not in the trial, and also affecting their outcome, the risk of cholera. Uh, these are the results from uh, the simulation study, so this is the Chechen Vanderweel IPW estimator um, versus the truth. So the truth is the solid line, the dotted is the IPW estimator. Uh, the upper left hand panel is the direct effect. Um, the upper right hand panel is a contour plot of the indirect effect. So um, uh, this is when this is when your coverage is say 0.6 versus when your coverage is 0.25 and you're unvaccinated. Um, the lower left is the total effect and the bottom right is the overall effect. The bottom line is the estimators seem to be working well in our hands. Um, we also did um, some uh, uh, computation with a naive estimator that made no attempt to adjust for confounding. And basically we just took um, groups whose coverage level was around 0.5 and then naively took differences in means. Um, and that estimator was empirically biased and it was just a way to show that we were simulating data in such a way that if you failed to adjust for confounding, you got the wrong answer. Uh, this is one more simulation study result just showing that the empirical sandwich variance estimator, so this is the average of that variance estimator, or average estimated standard error across the simulations is very close to the empirical standard error. So that seemed to be working well and the wall confidence intervals seem to be behaving properly. So with that, we went ahead and analyzed the data from, from MOTLAB. Uh, so this is uh, MOTLAB, and um, the gray dots here um, represent BARIs, so clusters of households. And then this rectangle um, is that area of uh, MOTLAB is blown up in panels B, C, and D. So we're invoking this partial interference assumption, so somehow we need to group individuals in such a way that we think it's reasonable to assume that there's no interference between groups. So to do that, we ran a clustering algorithm on the BARIs, a uh, single linkage agglomerative clustering algorithm. And the way this algorithm works is you put in it ahead of time the number of clusters that you would like, and then it will cluster um, the, the BARIs. So this was um, when we asked for 700 clusters total, we got this picture. And then just as a sensitivity analysis, we also ran things with only 400 clusters and also with 1,000 clusters. But the idea is that we're assuming once the clustering algorithm is done that there's no interference between, say, an individual in this BARI and an individual in that BARI because they're in different groups, different clusters. So here are the results from the, the, the trial. Um, again, we have the direct effect estimate, the indirect, the total, and the overall effects. Uh, the solid line there is the point estimate of the direct effect. That shaded region, those are point-wise, walled, 95% confidence intervals. The histogram is just showing you the empirical distribution of vaccine coverage in the study. 
So in the direct effect, you see the direct effect is largest when the coverage is, is low. It's about 4 or so when coverage is around 30%. So that says that when coverage is 30%, we expect about 4 fewer cases per 1,000 person years in vaccinated individuals compared to unvaccinated individuals. Um, on the other hand, if you, had, if you had looked at the direct effect, say you only looked at areas where there was relatively high coverage, you would have come to a very different conclusion. You would have gotten a point estimate that was much lower in a confidence interval that included zero, suggesting that the vaccine has no effect. So this, this is indicative of, of the importance of thinking about interference um, because you might, you might come to the wrong conclusion. In this case, this is a vaccine that probably has utility, but it might have been discarded if they just looked at the direct effect in a setting where there was high coverage. The indirect plot over here, so this contour plot, this gives the indirect effects, uh, indirect effect estimates. Uh, by definition, the, the diagonal line there is always going to equal zero. Um, and this plot's symmetric in absolute value. Um, the other thing, uh, so let's see, the largest um, indirect effect is farthest from the diagonal, which isn't too surprising. Here we get a point estimate about 4.5. So that says that amongst unvaccinated individuals, we'd expect about four and a half fewer cases of cholera per 1,000 person years when coverage is 60% compared to when it's around 30 or 35%. You also notice these, this contour plot, the, the contours aren't parallel to the line of equality, but they sort of fan out as the coverage decreases. Uh, and so what that suggests is that the relative indirect effect increases with coverage. In other words, um, going from, say, 50 to 60 percent vaccine coverage is going to avert more infections than going from 30 to 40 percent coverage, even though they're both a 10 percent increase in coverage. The direct effect contour plot looks quite different. Uh, so here the lines are almost vertical. And what this says is that uh, the risk of infection when you're vaccinated largely doesn't seem to depend on what's happening around you. It doesn't seem to matter if you're in a high coverage or a low coverage situation. Once you're vaccinated, that's sort of it. Um, in this plot, if you trace the diagonal line, so this is, remember, the diagonal lines where alpha equals alpha prime, so the coverages are the same in the two situations. That's just the direct effect. So if you, if you were to walk along the diagonal line along this contour, you would recover exactly the direct effect. The other thing to note in this plot is this zero contour, which is below the diagonal line. Um, so this is uh, the free loader curve. This is where being uh, unvaccinated in a high coverage situation affords the same risk as being vaccinated in a low coverage situation. So you're, you're unvaccinated and but you live in a place where everyone else is vaccinated, so, so you're good. You're as well off as somebody who's vaccinated in a low coverage situation. And then the total effect is given here, um, and this, this plot tends to look a lot like the, the indirect effect. And again, from a policy standpoint, this might be the most interesting in, in terms of setting, so say, setting goals for levels of vaccine coverage. Uh, these are a few sensitivity analysis plots. Um, this first one is showing what if we change that clustering algorithm so we have 400 or 1,000 clusters instead of 700. So the direct effect plot here, uh, the solid line is the same as before. The gray region is the same as before. Those are the point-wise confidence intervals. And then the dashed and the dotted lines are just the point estimates if instead you use 400 clusters or 1,000 instead of 700. And you can see largely that the results are pretty unsensitive to the number of clusters. It's a little hard to draw a contour plot with three different point estimates on it. So for the sensitivity analysis, we're just taking a slice of the contour plots, holding alpha fixed at 0.4. And that's what these three other pictures show you. Um, this is all based on a propensity score model, where you're predicting the probability that somebody chose to participate in the trial. And then there's this assumption of no unmeasured confounders uh, that I've selected the right set of covariates to make that assumption hold. So it's the usual sort of assumption one makes in observational settings where you're trying to draw a causal inference. It just so happens we have interference here. But as usual, you worry about your propensity score model and whether or not you've selected the right set of covariates. So we also have been looking at what if we change the covariates that we put into the model. And this is just showing you a sensitivity analysis with a slightly different um, propensity score model 
again, suggesting the results are fairly robust. Um, finally, I'll close with just uh, a few of the more recent things we've been working on. Um, these, these both come from Lon's uh, dissertation. So the, she's been looking at ways to sort of refine or extend the IPW estimators suggested by Eric and Tyler. Um, and so in this slide, I'm describing two different ways that she's, um, she's looked at uh, refining that. Um, the first is um, she generalized in the sense that she was able to relax the partial interference assumption. So imagine instead of assuming partial interference that each individual is allowed to have their own interference set. And somehow you know this. You're given information about, for each individual, who interferes with them. And then, based on that, let zi tilde be the treatment assignment vector for everybody that interferes with individual i. Then um, you can uh, generalize the IPW estimator that, was, that I showed you earlier uh, to this more um, relaxed setting, and you get an expression that looks like this. So it's, it's basically not much different than before. You're taking individual observed responses, and you're inverse weighting them by this estimated propensity score for individual I and everybody that interferes with them. You'll notice these IPW estimators have kind of a Horwitz-Thompson form. You've, you've got the observed response, indicator of whether or not somebody gets treatment, and you're dividing by this estimated propensity score. Well, Horwitz-Thompson estimators are known to be uh, unstable or have high variance. Um, so sometimes these stabilized IPW estimators are suggested instead. They take this kind of high act form. And the basic idea is you replace n with some estimator of n. Um, so even though it seems kind of silly because we know n, but that's, that's one way you can think about constructing these estimators. So she looked at two different high act type estimators by replacing n either with this quantity or this second quantity. And these are both, if you know the uh, propensity score, these are both unbiased estimators of n. Um, and it turns out the second one, which has in its denominator the same uh, probability that is in the numerator of the IPW estimator, that if you take this quantity and replace n with it, uh, it really performs well in terms of reducing the variance of these estimators. Um, she's been able to prove that in certain situations it will always reduce the variance. But empirically, she's shown that it's done very well. So these are uh, one set of simulations um, comparing the Eric and Tyler's IPW estimator to these two different HIAC type estimators that she's look, looked at. Um, and this is under three different scenarios. One where you know the propensity score. Another where you, you don't know it, but you correctly model it. And then a third scenario where you misspecify the model for the propensity score. When you know the propensity score, all three of them do well in terms of bias, but you can see that this second Hayek type estimator has a substantial reduction in standard error compared to the other two estimators. Um, and that's also true if you don't know the uh, propensity score, but you correctly model it. And it turns out that if you misspecify the propensity score model, for some reason the second Hayek estimator actually seems to do pretty well still. But apparently it, it has some robustness built in. Although I don't know if that's an artifact of this particular simulation study or if it's, it's more something you could, you could actually prove. Um, and then speaking of robustness, we also looked at uh, so-called doubly robust estimators in the presence of interference. Uh, so most of you perhaps are familiar with doubly robust estimators in the absence of interference. They look something like this. This is one way you could write down a doubly robust estimator. So the idea here is that you have two models. One is you model the outcome with a regression model. And then the other model is the model of the propensity score. And these, these, these estimators are doubly robust in the sense that you get a consistent estimator if either one of those models is correct. You don't necessarily need both of the models to be correct. So this would be an estimate of the average potential outcome if individuals assign treatment Z uh, according to the model. And then you add to that um, this term, which takes the uh, predicted residuals for each individual uh, who has received treatment Z, and you inverse weight it by their propensity score, or if you don't know the propensity score, by the estimated propensity score. And so basically what happens is if, you're, if your outcome model is correct, uh, this uh, first term gives you the right answer, and this second term goes away because the residuals have mean zero. Uh, on the other hand, if you get the outcome model wrong, 
uh, but you get the propensity score model correct, then this first term will be biased, but the second term will correct for the bias. Um, so uh, Lon proposes this doubly robust estimator that basically takes the same form but allows for, for partial interference. Um, and so for individual J and group I, uh, their contribution, the estimator, has two parts. Uh, the first part is based on the outcome model. And it's just modeling what would be the average. It's, it's based on the fitted outcome model. It's the average, the predicted average outcome for individual J when they receive treatment Z, and their group gets allocation strategy alpha. And then the second piece um, is that inverse probability weighted piece by the estimated group level propensity score, which will correct for the bias in the first piece if your outcome model is incorrect, provided the propensity score model is correct. Uh, and she's shown, she can prove, we've proved that this is a doubly robust estimator uh, as the number of groups go large. So again, you get the right answer provided at least one of your two models is correct. Um, and here are some empirical results that give you exactly what you would expect. So these were simulations under four different scenarios where either the propensity score model is correct, but the outcome model is misspecified, vice versa. Both models are correctly specified, or both models are wrong. Yeah. So if the propensity score model is correct, but the outcome model is wrong, then the regression estimator is biased. IPW does fine, and so does the doubly robust estimator. In the scenario where the propensity score model is incorrect, the, propensity, the IPW estimator is wrong, but the regression model and the doubly robust estimator do OK. Um, so that you see the doubly robust estimator is doing well in either scenario, hence the doubly robust property. If they're both correct, doubly robust does well. And if they're both wrong, it, it does poorly as well. So no, no real surprises here, I don't think, in, in the results. Um, so that's it. Um, thanks for your attention. Again, thanks for coming. I think uh, there's a lot of open problems in interference. It's sort of a new area. People have gotten interested in the last five or 10 years. And there's a lot of people working on it now, but there's certainly still a lot of open problems. Um, you know, one of the problems that I've been talking to a few folks here about is, is um, relaxing this partial interference assumption and, and envisioning instead that you have a network that describes the interference structure and how do you do inference in that case. Uh, I think there are several people working on that problem. Another sort of open question, as far as I can tell, is how much of the interference structure can you identify from the data? And how much of it just do you have to assume a priori because it's not identifiable and then conduct sensitivity analysis? Um, to assess how sensitive your results are to that assumption. Uh, and here are a few references. Thanks a lot. Ben? So uh, in the example you presented involving data from MATLAB, which is not a computer program but a place. Right. It's not MATLAB. <laughs> MATLAB. It's like a county in Bangladesh. That's the way to think about it. Okay. Well, uh, in, in the Bangladeshi county data, you, uh, there's, um, there's random assignment of individuals. Right. Uh, but then there's uh, there's some other structure which is in control that you're sort of modeling uh, in, that's, 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 that's governing differences in uh, uh, the penetration of the vaccine uh, in, in different uh, subunits. So um, one could one could presumably look at the individual assignment just done to itself um, to get a handle on the direct effect. Uh, uh, and you, you did talk about the, the, the direct effect. But then you went on to say that um, from policymakers' perspective, the indirect and total effects may be more relevant in that case. And those are the ones that leaned on the additional model that you had with uh, extra sort of case. My question is, uh, for that, for those inferences, the inferences of uh, total effect and so forth, um, uh, how much do you get from having that random assignment at the individual level? How much better is this kind of randomized design that doesn't have these two levels of random assignment that, that were present in the ideal case we talked about today? Right. Um, what is that? What is that? What is that body in terms of protection from bias and, and things like that? The target inferences that indirect. Well, uh, in the, as you know, in the observational setting, we always have to make this uh, some sort of assumptions to move forward. And 
Um, so those inferences are as good as those assumptions are. Um, I, th I think in the ideal situation, if this is really what you're after, you would do a two-stage randomized study, but that's not always going to be feasible. Um, I, I suppose one, we haven't, we haven't done this, but I, I suppose one thing you could do um, would be to compare the direct effect estimates from the IPW approach with the direct effect estimates based on just the randomized data, right, and see how they compare. And that might be, a, in some sense, an assessment of model fit or model check for the IPW estimators. If they gave you very different answers, it would make you nervous about the IPW analysis, right? Yeah, so there were two, we found two variables that were strongly predictive of participation in the trial and risk of infection. And they were age and how far did you live from a river. Cholera is a waterborne disease. Um, and uh, I think the uh, older folks were less likely to participate and at lower risk of infection. So maybe they knew they weren't at risk. And so they said, I'm not going to bother getting vaccinated. Uh, and with distance to the river, uh, the closer you were to the river, the more likely you were to participate, and the more likely you were to get cholera. And they're both pretty strong predictors in the, in the mixed effects logistic regression models we looked at. Um, highly significant p-values. There were a few other variables we found that were predictive of participation or of risk of cholera, but not of both. Yeah, we haven't we haven't tried that. I think it's a great idea. You mentioned earlier that the risk effects are the very assessments that quantifies. Have you thought about whether there's another direct assessment that will quantify something like these numbers? Right. We haven't. I think that's a an open problem to work on. Um, the bias of the variance estimator, but we'll go back to Neyman, the classic causal inference. The bias of that variance estimator goes down as the sample size increases. So it's not something that you have to worry about in large samples. Um, but I don't know about our, the variance estimators that we're using in the presence of interference, if that's true. And I don't know if it would be true. My, my, my sense is that there, the bias goes away when the number of groups gets large, but not if the number of groups stays fixed and the groups themselves get large. But we haven't looked at it. There is a, so the, the actual, the classic causal inference story is slightly more complicated than I made it sound. So you can, there's some information in the data that can be used to get bounds on the variance estimator. Um, so you don't have to just use the simple variance estimator I described. You can, you can do something more complicated. And um, you can't, while you can't identify the variance, you can get bounds on it. Um, and then you can estimate those bounds. So it seems possible you could do something like that here as well. And I, I don't know about resampling or bootstrap or some such thing. In this initial um, analysis, um, so when, when Tyler and Eric proposed this estimator. They showed it was unbiased when you knew the propensity score. And then that was it. They didn't show any, any other theoretical properties of it. So when we used it, of course, we didn't know the propensity score and we had to estimate it. And then uh, you know, we, di we didn't know any of the properties. Um, and so we, we used the bootstrap to compute the confidence intervals. Um, and then the, the reviewer the editor complained and said, what's the justification for that? 
And so we went back and instead derived the large sample properties using M estimation theory and gave a justification for using the sandwich estimator. Okay, sir. Is there intuition to go with the